Hi, my name's Mark, and today I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know to start your knitting journey. This will be a sort of first knitting lesson for you. So if you're brand new, this is the right place. And if you're someone who's already been knitting but wants to firm up their technique, this is another good place for you to be. There are several benefits to becoming a knitter. First, you spend a lot of time on a hobby or a craft that hopefully you'll enjoy doing. And there are also things like improved memory and a sort of therapeutic meditative skill that you can gain through the practice of knitting. I'm also a big fan of crochet, so if you're someone who crochets, welcome. And if you're someone who doesn't do knitting or crochet, I'd recommend taking the time to learn both but pick one to do first, and once you get a handle of it, then you can move to the next craft. No matter where you are in your knitting journey, make sure to give yourself plenty of patience and space to learn the skill. Knitting is something that is extremely repetitive, so the motions you make should be done in a way that's comfortable for you and also efficient for your hands, the fiber you're using, and even the needle size you choose. So. All of that said, give yourself plenty of space and patience as you learn this skill, and find some nice materials to use as you practice. Let's get started. Let's start by looking at the supplies that you'll definitely need, and after that I'll show you a couple extra things that you'll need as you work your first project. We'll need yarn, and of course we'll need knitting needles. Besides that, I would recommend having a pair of scissors. You can use craft scissors or any sort of scissors you have around. And then the added supplies that you'll use down the road include a tapestry or darning needle. We use this to weave in the tails of our yarn, whether that's the tail at the beginning or end of a project, or if you join new yarn, whether you're changing colors or just making something so big that you use multiple skeins or balls of yarn. And the last extra supply would be a stitch marker. Stitch markers come in all shapes and sizes. Some are very simple, just rounds or um, different geometric shapes. And then others are more decorative. In front of me, I have what's called a super bulky yarn. You can see that this strand of yarn is pretty thick. And yarn comes in all shapes and sizes and colors. So if you haven't already, go watch my video on yarn weights and fiber content. I'll link it right above. And uh, I just show you several examples of yarn from lace weight, which is sort of the thinnest weight yarn people typically make, up to super bulky, which is one of the thickest strands possible. So for my teaching video, I'm using super bulky, which means that all of my motions I make will be exaggerated and hopefully as easy for you to see as possible. For your practice at home, if you're buying new yarn, I'd recommend going with a worsted weight. Worsted is maybe two clicks down from this as far as weight, and it's a good medium heavy yarn. You'll still be making stitches that are easy to see, but you won't be working on such a large needle that you maybe find discomfort. Why does it matter that I use this specific needle with this specific yarn? Well, the answer is because this yarn is so thick or heavy, I need a decently sized needle to match the size of the strand of yarn. As I make my stitches, which you'll see in just a few minutes, each stitch should fit naturally around the size of the needle. So heavy or big yarn needs a big needle. If I were working with a really lightweight yarn, like fingering weight, sock yarn, or lace weight yarn, my needles would be much skinnier. And again, that's going to work out so that the stitches I'm making fit comfortably around the size of the needle. If I were working with this yarn on a significantly smaller needle, it would mean that my stitches are smaller, they would feel tighter, and the fabric I'm making would be more compact. If I were working on an even larger size needle, too big for the recommendation of this yarn, 
then my fabric I'm creating would be loose and it might have holes or gaps in it. So using the recommended needle size for the yarn you have will be the best way to get you to a sort of average even fabric and it should make your knitting the most comfortable experience possible. I understand that you may not be using yarn that you've bought specifically for this knitting practice. If you're using yarn that you already have around the house or maybe something a friend or family member gave you, you might not have the label anymore. In that case, if you just have yarn without a label, you could look at the thickness of the strand and go to the video I posted on yarn weights and see which weight of yarn matches yours most accurately. That'll give you an idea of what size needle to use. And another thing you can do is the wrap test. If I take my strand of yarn and I wrap it around a needle, I'm gonna wrap as many times as I can with this length, making sure that my wraps are snug right up against each other. At that point, I could measure the wraps, and once I have an inch measurement, that'll help guide me to the weight of yarn I'm using. It may sound a little bit wacky, but it's a real test to figure out the weight of your yarn. If you look online at a yarn manufacturer's website, they should show you how many wraps per inch, or WPI, it takes for certain yarns to reach certain categories of weight. If you are buying yarn brand new and you visit a shop and find yarn that looks like this, you'll need to have it wound before you can work with it. So when my yarn looks like this, it's twisted up and it's still technically in a hank. Once I untwist it, you'll see that it's just one large loop of yarn. If you were to work from this loop, it would tangle up pretty quickly on you. So typically, a hank is stretched over a swift and once it's placed on the swift, you find one end of it and you start to wind it. You can either wind it by hand into a ball or you can use a winder and that will take the yarn and turn it into what's called a cake. Once the yarn is wound into a cake, you can either pull from the outside or find the center yarn and pull there. If you purchased your yarn from a big box store or if it was yarn already given to you from someone else's stash, it might be in what's called a bullet skein, which looks a little more like a log of yarn. You can just pull the end of that and it will tumble freely, or you can search for the center and pull that way. And of course, if your yarn is wound into a ball, you can just find the end and let the ball roll freely. Typically, people will put the yarn inside a yarn bowl or a yarn bag, project bag, anything like that, to keep it from rolling around the entire house. All right. Now that we have our supplies, let's get started with our knitting. So in front of me, I have a cake of super bulky yarn, which means I'm using a US 13 needle. Again, I'd recommend you starting on worsted weight yarn if you have it. You're gonna be working on a smaller size needle. Your yarn's gonna be a little bit lighter, but the whole situation should be a bit more comfortable. I'll start by taking the end of my yarn and giving myself a little bit of length. I don't actually need the needle yet. Our very first step is to make a slip knot. If you're familiar with slip knots and you have an easy way of doing it, go for it. If not, I'll show you how I do mine. I take the cut end of the yarn and I place it in my left hand. I lay the working yarn, or the yarn that's attached to the ball, to the right. Then, Securing both ends with my thumb, I'll give the top of it a twist. Once I have a loop, I'll bring two fingers through and I'll grab the cut end of yarn, making sure to hold on to both tails. Then I'll just pull that through, creating a slip knot. The slip knot is able to slip larger or smaller, and as I change the size of that opening, I'm doing so with the cut tail. The reason we want to use the cut tail to change the size of the knot is so that our first stitch we make can later be tightened up just in case it's grown at all during our project. It gives us a nicer finish. I'll make that slip knot again. I'm taking the cut end of yarn, placing it in my left hand, and then laying the working yarn next to it. Holding on to both ends, I'll give the top one twist and I'll bring two fingers through, and I'll grab that cut end of the yarn, 
and pull upwards until I have a knot. It's important that we leave a tail of yarn that we can weave in later. I'm trying to leave about a six to eight inch cut tail. That way, when I finish my project, I can use my tapestry or darning needle to weave in the end so it looks seamless. If you leave too short of a tail, that's about one to three inches, it can be really hard to secure that end and it could lead to the project starting to unravel. Once I have my slip knot, I'll take a knitting needle and I'll place the slip knot around it. Then I can snug that knot just so the yarn sits around the needle. I don't want it to be extremely tight and I also don't want the slip knot to be so loose that the yarn could just fall off the needle. So I'm placing it over the needle and I'm giving a gentle tug so that the yarn can still slide along the needle and if I were to throw it like a dart, it's not going to fall off. Now it's time to cast on. This is our first skill in knitting. Each project requires you to cast on just once at the beginning of the project. And then similarly at the end of the project, we need to cast off or bind off the work. That just secures all of the stitches. So I'll take the needle in my right hand and I'm just holding it between my four fingers and my thumb. I'm gonna ignore the tail for now, just keeping it out of the way. With my left hand, I'll place it under the strand of yarn and I'll grasp it between my four fingers and my thumb. Then I'll give myself a thumbs up. I'll next take my thumb and I'll dip towards my surface and then return to my starting position. After I've done that motion, I'll take the needle and I'll insert it into this loop I've created and run it alongside my thumb. At that point, I'll slide this new loop or new stitch further up the needle and I'll gently tug on my working yarn. Again, I'm just giving a gentle tug so that the stitch we've created can still slide on the needle, but isn't so loose that it would fall off if I threw my needle like a dart. So we've cast on one new stitch and our slip knot counts as the first stitch. So again, I'll take my hand and run it under the working yarn until I can grip it there, give myself a thumbs up, dip the thumb below the yarn, returning it to my starting position, and then taking my needle into that loop against my thumb and giving the yarn a gentle tug. The yarn is still in my hand, so I'll just dip my thumb down, insert the needle, and give a gentle tug. I'll show this once to the front camera. So I'm taking the yarn into my hand, giving a thumbs up, dipping down and back up, and then I can enter that stitch and give a gentle tug. This cast on method is called the backwards loop cast on, and it's one of the most simple ways to cast on. I will recommend that once you get started and feel that you have some confidence with your knitting, I recommend that you explore all the different ways there are to cast on. I'll plug a book here. There are probably countless ways and new ways being invented every day to cast on your work. The reason we have so many different ways to cast on is because they all give a different finish to the work and they also provide a different amount of strength. The backwards loop cast on isn't the most sturdy cast on there is, but it gives a nice finish and it's extremely easy to do and to learn for the first time. I'll continue my backwards loop cast on until I have 12 stitches on my needle. The way we'll count our stitches is by spreading out and counting the loops that are along the top edge of our needle. So there should be 12 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This edge that's facing me is our cast on edge. You can see that it looks very tidy, kind of just looks like twists. Some cast ons look more like a braid, but most of them look twisted like this. Now that we've cast on our stitches, 
I'll give myself another length of yarn, and I'll pass this needle from my right hand to my left. Again, I'll hold the needle between four fingers and my thumb, and I wanna make sure that I'm holding it gently. I have a good grip on it, but I don't need to clamp down or hold with any added tension. As I mentioned before, as we learn to knit, especially if you're doing this for the first time, it's really important that you find the most natural, comfortable, and ergonomic way to hold your needles and make your stitches. So with the needle held gently in my hand, I'll slide the stitches towards the tip, leaving about an inch of space. If my stitches are too far down the needle, they're going to be extremely hard to work. So I always make sure before I start a new row that my stitches are fairly close to the tip of the needle. Then I'll take the other needle in my right hand. We'll lead with this needle as we create our new stitches. The next thing to do is to tension our yarn. I'll pull the yarn to the left side of my working space and I also have the yarn sitting to my left. I'm going to tension the yarn by wrapping it around my pinky once. I'll bring my pinky under the strand of yarn and then return it to its starting position. Again, I'll bring my pinky under the yarn and then return it to its starting position, gripping it between the pinky and ring finger. Once I turn my hand over, you'll see that the yarn is firmly tensioned. I can't yank it away without having it drag through those fingers. This is a really simple way to tension your yarn. Just like cast-ons, there are dozens of ways to tension your yarn. Some people like to tension their yarn more. Maybe you could do another wrap of the pinky so that it really drags as you pull. Other people will run the yarn through their fingers so that it can drag a little bit as you work your stitches. And other people don't require quite as much tension. It might just be that the yarn is gently held along with the needle and that gives them enough to work their stitches evenly. The point of tensioning our yarn is that we can control how much yarn comes through each new stitch we make. If we don't have any way of tensioning the yarn, it's more likely that our stitches will become oversized, creating a really loose and holy fabric. So again, just with my pinky under the yarn, between those two fingers, turning my hand, I'll tension the yarn to start. Then I have my pointer finger coming underneath the yarn, and that pointer finger is going to work as my guide as I knit and later as I purl. To work a knit stitch, we will always enter the stitch from left to right. I'll zoom in a little bit for this. With my needles, I'll find the left side of the first stitch and I will drag the needle into that loop so that now two needles are sharing my first stitch. Once it's through, my needles will sit in sort of an X shape in front of me. If you find that it's more comfortable to have your needles like a T, that's fine, but I find that the X allows both of my elbows to sit comfortably by my body. Next, we will do what's called a yarn over. Using my pointer finger to guide, I'll bring the yarn above and over this working needle. Once I've completed my yarn over, it's time to bring the back needle through the stitch and bring the strand of yarn through with it. I've just pulled what was the yarn over through that stitch. Now to finish our knit stitch, I'll need to remove the stitch from my left-hand needle that we've just worked. I'll push it off gently, and that's our first knit stitch. Again, we enter the stitch from left to right. What I mean by that is that I'm not entering it here from the right side and coming through. Instead, I'm entering from the left side of the stitch and moving to the right. Once my needle is in the stitch, I'll take my finger and bring the yarn up and over before pulling the back needle through this stitch. You can help the yarn by keeping a pointer finger resting against it. And 
And once you bring your stitch through, make sure it stays safely on the needle before sending the stitch you've just knit off the left needle. Now it doesn't look like much at all, but I promise we're knitting. Again, I'm going to enter the stitch from left to right. This is called knitwise. Anytime we're entering a stitch from left to right, sort of opening that stitch up, we're doing it knitwise. Then with my pointer finger, I'll bring the yarn up and over. And then I'm going to let the needles touch the whole time I'm doing this so that I don't drop my yarn over. Once it comes through the stitch, I can bring that stitch off the left needle, completing my knit. Again, I'll enter from left to right, yarn over, and I'll pull that stitch through before pulling the stitch on the left needle off. You can see the last couple of stitches I've worked, I've pulled the stitch off the left needle just with the tension of the right needle. As I lift it up and over, it brings the stitch off the left needle, which is a great way to do it. Some people are needle pushers. They'll take the tip of the left needle and push, scooting their stitches up. And then as they finish a stitch, they'll use their finger to push, and that stitch comes off the left needle. Again, it's great to keep your stitches fairly close to the tip of the needle. I'm leaving about an inch of space here. I don't want it too far because then we're at risk of losing a stitch, but keeping it about an inch to an inch and a half from the end of the needle is a good place to be. I've entered the stitch. I'm bringing my yarn over. And then I'm carefully bringing the right hand needle through that first stitch. And then I'll usher the left stitch off the needle. Again, entering from left to right, yarn over, pull the yarn through, and remove the stitch from the left needle. I've got four stitches left on this row. Now when I reach the last stitch, I treat everything the same. I'll enter the stitch from left to right, I'll bring my yarn over, and I'll bring the needle through, and then I'll bring that last stitch off the left needle. As always, I'll gently slide my stitches up to safety, and now we can see our first row that we've knit. At this point, it just looks like another row of twists. You can see the other side of the cast on here, and then one row in, we have more twists. They kind of look like popcorn kernels, especially in this color. Now that we've finished that row, I'll take the needle and I'll pass it back to my left hand. This is called turning our work, and whenever we're working on straight needles or working flat, we'll always turn the work after each row. Once I turn my work, I should always know where I am because my working yarn will be on the right side of the work. That should also be the same side as the tip of the needle. If you pick things up and you're trying to knit, obviously we don't want the head of the needle or the tail, whichever way you're thinking about it. We want the pointed tip of the needle and we also want the working yarn to be ready to go on that side. Now while I'm here, I'll point out one danger, and that is the danger of using your tail to knit. Because we have this generous six to eight inch tail, it would be pretty easy to start knitting our second row and tension that tail and knit with it, but then we're gonna run out of tail and we're gonna be several stitches in without our working yarn. So when you get to this point, make sure that your tail is out of the way and the working yarn, the yarn that's attached to the cake or ball of yarn, is what we're about to use to knit. Again, I'll tension my yarn, and I have my pointer, feet, my pointer finger ready to guide. I have my right hand needle ready, and I'll enter the stitch from left to right. I'll yarn over, 
and I'll pull that stitch through and remove the stitch from the left hand needle. Again, that tail is just flapping around down there. Don't worry about it. On this row, I'll demonstrate the rhythm of knitting I like to think about. We have three main steps or three main movements we're using. Step one is to enter the stitch from left to right. Step two is to yarn over. And step three is a combination of pulling the stitch through and removing the stitch from the left hand needle. So the rhythm I like to think of is one, two, three, combining those last two steps. That's one, two, three. We enter, yarn over, complete. Enter, yarn over, complete. So as I'm knitting, I really like to think one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And it helps speed up or smooth the process. Now I've got two stitches left. Whenever you get to the last stitch, treat it the same as all the others. We enter the stitch, yarn over, and pull the stitch through, removing it from the left needle. Now we have an additional row that we've knit. You can see it just looks like another row of popcorn or twists. I'm going to knit three more rows of knit stitches before moving on to the purl. So I'll turn the needle to my left hand. Just a reminder that I'm always keeping the fabric that we're creating closest to my body and the live stitches or the loops on the needle away from me. I don't want things to turn around like this and I also don't want things to end up twisted. If you're picking up your project after setting it down for a day or leaving it in your bag, make sure to untwist things so you're looking at one even layer of stitches and one even layer of fabric, and make sure you have things facing you the right way, slid to the end of your needles, and that you've got plenty of working yarn untangled and ready to go. Now that we've knit a few rows, let's look at the fabric that we're creating. This is what's called garter stitch fabric. And it's because we're knitting every stitch on both the right and wrong side of the work. Typically in patterns, you'll hear people refer to the right side. That's usually the front of the work or the finish side that we'll be looking at when we finish our project. And then the wrong side is the reverse. Some stitches are reversible, like the garter stitch, if I flip this over, it looks the same from both sides. Other stitches like stockinette, which we'll look at in just a second, are not reversible. They have a completely different look from the right side to the wrong side. So we get garter stitch by knitting every stitch of the work, both right side and wrong side. This is a really common stitch pattern that's used in a lot of patterns. And again, it just looks kind of like snakes or kernels of popcorn or twists along the work. So how do we create stockinette or a different type of fabric? We can create several different types of texture or look just by combining two stitches, the knit and the purl. You've already learned the knit, so now let's look at the purl. I'm gonna start the same way with my work slid about an inch to the edge of the needle and I have my working yarn, which I'll tension just like before. Once I have the yarn tensioned, I'm actually going to bring it to the front of the work. When we knit, we always have the yarn held to the back of our work or the underside. When we purl, we need the yarn in the front of the work. 
Now that my yarn is tensioned and ready to go, I'll take my needle, and this time I'll enter the stitch purlwise. With knitwise stitches, we always entered from left to right, but now with purlwise stitches, we'll enter from right to left. That's it, that's all it takes. I enter from right to left, and my working needle is on the front of this stack. Again, I'm entering from right to left, and now I have two needles sharing the first stitch. This time when I yarn over, I'm going to bring the yarn in front of the stitch and back around to where it started. Once the yarn is wrapped, I'll be bringing the front needle through our stitch, moving to the back of the work. Once I've brought that stitch through, just like before, we'll complete the stitch by removing that stitch from the left needle. And that's our first purl. Again, we'll enter the stitch from right to left. I'll yarn over, coming around the front and returning to my starting position. We'll pull that stitch through by moving our needle to the back. And then we'll complete the stitch by removing that left loop from the left needle. And that's two purl stitches. Now a note about yarning over. Once I enter the stitch, I bring the yarn around and I'm over directing my yarn over. Meaning I'm bringing my pointer finger all the way to the front of the work towards my body, which helps me get this loop pulled through the stitch without it falling off the needle. I'll demonstrate without over directing. I enter the stitch from right to left, yarn over, and if I just leave my yarn sort of hanging out towards the back or the middle, as I come to pull my needle through, it most likely will fall off the needle before I can bring it through the stitch. So when I yarn over, I'm over directing it just a bit so that it really easily comes through the stitch, and then I finish by removing that stitch from the left needle. Entering from right to left, yarn over, over directing the yarn over, and pulling through. Now I'm making these purl stitches with the same rhythm as my knits. It's step one, two, three. Step one, two, three. Step one, two, three. And that's our purl. We're just working the reverse of a knit, and in the fabric, it's doing the same thing. It's reversing what we would get from a knit stitch. Let me purl across another row. Bringing my yarn to the front of the work, I'll enter the stitch from right to left, yarn over, pull the stitch through, remove the stitch from the left needle. Enter, yarn over, pull through. Enter, yarn over, pull through. And that's our purl stitch. Here I am purling two more rows. If I continue to purl each row, I'll still end up with garter stitch because I'm working my stitches the same way on both the right side and the wrong side. So here I have a couple rows of garter stitch up top, some rows at the bottom, and they're separated by a different stitch pattern. 
This different stitch pattern is called stockinette, and we can create it by using knit stitches on the right side of the work and purl stitches on the wrong side of the work. This way, the stitches on the right side are always being created the same way, and they'll look different. So here I am on the wrong side of the work, and I'll purl across. That means my yarn is in the front, and I'm entering the stitches purlwise from right to left. Now as I turn my work, I'm on the right side, and I'll knit these stitches. So I'm knitting the right side, purling the wrong side. With my yarn in back, I'll enter the stitch from left to right and complete my stitches by knitting. I'm going to work two more rows of this repeat before I show you the fabric we're creating. Now on the wrong side of my work, I purl across. I've got the yarn in front, and I'm entering my stitches from right to left, purl-wise. And in knitting, we just have knits and purls. We only have two stitches. In crochet, you're always working the crocheted stitches in a similar manner by yarning over and pulling loops through with the hook, but there are so many different stitches in crochet. It's kind of endless, which is great, but it also means it can be complicated to learn how to do different fabrics. Here on the right side of the work, I'll knit these stitches, which means my yarn is in the back and I'm entering each stitch from left to right. I'll work the wrong side once more, and then we'll look at the fabric we've created. Now that I've worked several rows of knitting the right side and purling the wrong side, let's look at the fabric. I hope you can tell that this fabric is super different. Instead of the popcorn kernels or twists of the garter stitch, now we have what looks like braids or plaits. You can see all of these V's, and the V's are our knit stitches. Since we're knitting the right side and purling the wrong side, we're only seeing the knit on the right side of the fabric. As I mentioned, purls are a reverse of knit, so when I purl the wrong side, it means what's happening on the right side is a knit stitch. Similarly, if I flip this over, the wrong side of the fabric looks like an even more compact or tighter version of the garter stitch because all we're seeing here are pearls. Now, all three of these fabric examples, garter stitch, reverse stockinette, and stockinette, are used in patterns. So being able to create these with just a knit and a pearl is pretty exciting. You already know how to do three different varieties of fabric with these two stitches. Now that we've learned how to cast on, knit, and purl, let's figure out how to secure our work by casting off or binding off. There are several ways you can bind off. Just like all the ways of casting on, we can bind off many ways to create different looks for our fabric. There are also certain cast-ons and bind-offs that allow stretchiness, if it's something that's going to be worn and needs to fit over your head or over your arms. But in this case for our sample, 
we just need a straightforward bind off. I'm going to start just like I'm knitting with the yarn tensioned and the stitches slid about an inch from the tip of the needle. I'll knit the first stitch of my row just like we were doing before. And I'll knit my second stitch just as before. Now that we have two stitches on our right hand needle, I'm going to enter the furthest stitch from left to right. I'm not twisting the stitch or going into the back of it. I'm just lifting it off the needle from left to right. And I'm going to bring this stitch over the next stitch on our needle. To do that, I'll stretch it open a little bit, use my finger to help, and slide that stitch over, keeping my needles in contact the whole time. Once it's slid over, you can see that I only have one stitch on my right hand needle. So we've officially bound off one stitch. The next step is to knit one stitch. Again, I have two stitches on my right hand needle. This is where the pattern starts. I'll enter the furthest stitch and I'll lift it over the new stitch we just created. Once I've done that, you'll see that I have one stitch on my right hand needle. We've officially bound off two stitches. So the pattern continues. I knit the next stitch, resulting in two stitches on the right hand needle. I'll enter the furthest stitch and bring it over the most recent stitch we've created. Then I'll knit another stitch. I'll bind off one and knit one. I'll bind off again and knit one. And this process repeats until we have bound off all of our stitches. Now that I reached my final stitch, I only have one stitch on the right hand needle, which means I knit this final stitch, which means my left hand needle is free, but I still have two stitches on my right hand needle. Following the pattern, I'll lift up the furthest stitch and bring it over the newest stitch we've created, which leaves me with one stitch. Once you're down to one stitch, You'll need your scissors. And I'll cut this tail of yarn, leaving about six to eight inches, just like we started with for the, for the cast on. Once my tail is cut, I can pull the stitch all the way through. With my stitch pulled through, all of my stitches are bound off and secured. At this point, nothing can unravel. And there's our fabric. You can see the stockinette stitch at the top portion, the bind off edge, which looks kind of like stockinette stitch on its side. And then we have our garter stitch at the bottom. If I flip this sample over, the reverse side has garter stitch at the bottom and reverse stockinette at the top. They're both very similar, except the top you can tell the bits of popcorn are more compact than the bottom. If I stretch this out, the bottom actually has rows between it where the top is all popcorn. And the last thing I could do to this is weave in my ends. Just in case you wanna tidy up your swatch that you've created, or maybe you've made a whole project, I'll show you how we use our tapestry needle. I like to take one of the ends and fold it over the top of the needle and give it a nice squeeze. With that tight squeeze, I should be able to push the end through the eye of the needle, which is way easier than trying to feed it in through the frayed end. Now I give myself about two inches of tail and I'm just going to bury or weave in this end. I like to find a similar stitch pattern that I can follow. 
So I'm bringing my end around and I'm going to loop it through these two stitches to start and we'll see how that looks. I think that looks pretty tidy. So then I can continue weaving in the end. Some people will dip lower down into the work. Other people will just work along the bind off. It's up to you. I'm going to drop down one row and send it across about three stitches. And I'll pull that through. As I pull, I don't want to yank to scrunch up my work. I want to keep everything nicely stretched so that this weaving in doesn't, uh, doesn't affect my fabric at all. And now I'm going to send this back through, hiding it in the bind off at the top. And for this bulky wool, it's pretty sticky. It sticks to itself a good bit. So I think that's sufficient weaving in. I'll take my scissors and I'll cut all the way to the tail. And then I'll give it one more stretch just to hide that woven in end. Now for my cast on edge, this is where we use the slip knot. So I can give this just the slightest tug to make sure that initial stitch isn't any bigger than it needs to be. And I'll do the same thing. I'll fold the end over my tapestry needle, squeeze, and I'll push that end through the eye. And I'll find a fairly discreet place where I can weave in this end. All right, I think that'll do the trick. I'll grab my scissors and I'll cut that end fairly close, making sure not to cut any of my stitches. And there we have it. Now our little swatch has no tails and it's all finished. Now that we've learned how to cast on, knit, purl, and bind off, I wanna give a little bit of advice about practicing. It's important that you find time or create time to practice every day if you can, just so that these new skills become comfortable in your hands. I don't think that you need to be practicing more than 15, 20 minutes each day. Especially as a beginner, it's important that you find the most comfortable, ergonomic way to hold your needles, tension your yarn, and work these stitches. If you sit down for 30 minutes to an hour, and you get more and more frustrated with your work as you're trying to knit or trying to purl, it probably won't help you in the long run. This is something that should feel meditative, peaceful. Um, so make sure as you're practicing it, you do it with space, with patience, and make sure that it's something that you're having fun doing. A lot of new knitters ask, when is it gonna get fun? When does it get easy? It does get fun and easy once it gets comfortable. So give yourself 10, 15 minutes each day just to sit and practice a row of knits, practice a row of purls, and then return to it in another day. Before I leave you, I wanna give five knitting tips for beginners. If you're just beginning your journey, keep these things in mind as you practice. And if you're someone who's watching my video who already knits, if this isn't something you're already doing, give it a try and see if it helps your knitting practice. All right, tip number one, make sure whenever you're knitting, you use a matching needle size for the weight of yarn you choose. I see a lot of people choose really, really bulky yarn and they're using tiny needles just because it's a pair that they already have. If that's your scenario and there's no way for you to get other supplies, then I totally understand practice in the way that you can. However, if you have access to needles online or in a local store or from a friend who has supplies, make sure you take the time to get a needle size that works with your yarn. It's going to make the knitting more comfortable, it's going to make your stitches look better, and it's going to make the fabric of whatever you're creating a lot nicer. 
Next, use a natural fiber if possible. Again, you may be using yarn that you already have and you're not planning on spending any money to buy new supplies. That's totally fine. But if you're able to shop for something specifically for your knitting practice, using wool is a great choice. Wool has a lot of give, a lot of flexibility to it, it feels good in the hands, and it's really forgiving with your knitting. If you're using acrylic, you might find that it's a little more difficult or a little more stubborn of a fiber. It can also feel a little bit squeaky. And if you're using cotton, cotton's a great natural fiber, but if you're starting out for the first time, cotton also can be a little bit inflexible. So I'd recommend finding a wool you can work with when you're practicing. The next bit of advice is probably the most important I have. When you're knitting, always finish your row. Unless there's some sort of emergency that causes you to put your knitting down, finish your row before you take a break. This helps your stitches look better, it also keeps your tension more even, and the biggest thing of all, it will help you know where you are when you pick your work back up. If you stop in the middle of a row, you run the risk of picking up your work in the wrong hands and knitting back across stitches that you've already worked and ignoring stitches that haven't been worked yet, which means your fabric will be lopsided and will start to grow in a crazy direction. Tip number four goes hand in hand with my practice advice. Find a little bit of time to knit every day. If you're brand new to the skill, knitting every day is gonna help you master this craft a lot more quickly. And if you're someone who's been knitting forever and you don't knit every day, Give yourself a reason to sit down for five or 10 minutes and work on a project. And tip number five for new knitters, give yourself goals. Set some sort of goal, whether it's to finish one row each day, or if it's to knit for 10 minutes straight, give yourself some sort of goal that you can work towards so that you don't get too bored or even too lazy with your practice. In my knitting, I give myself little goals constantly. Sometimes the goal is pretty big, like I'm gonna finish my sweater in one week. And I don't always get there. It might take me two or three weeks to finish a project, but if I have that goal set, it means I'm working on it every day and I'm finding an excuse to invest in that project. Other goals when I sit down might be like the one I recommended for you. Get to the end of this row. Some of my projects have really complicated rows, whether it's color work or cables or following charts. So if it's part of a project that is more tedious, I give myself a goal to get through that row. And again, it makes the projects move by more swiftly. I hope that you've had fun today learning or working on a new skill. And if you're someone who's watching this video for fun, think about knitting. If you're already a knitter, I'm glad to be in your company. And if you're new to this skill, give yourself time, give yourself patience as you learn this hobby. If you're brand new to knitting, I'd recommend finding somebody in person that could look at what you're doing and check in with some of your skills. But if that's not something you have available, then of course the internet is a great resource. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video today. If you're new to my channel or someone who enjoys my videos, I'd appreciate you taking the time to like, comment, or subscribe to the channel for future videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.